And good morning and welcome everybody. Um, make sure our sound is pretty good here. All right, well we had, uh, I'll let you guys uh, have a chance, many of you have already probably done that. Um, we've got a lot of travelers still leaving Fort Lauderdale tonight, today. Uh, I know Sonia and Ruth and Jim, people traveling all the way back to Bend, Oregon. We've got people <laughs> back trying to get back up to Georgia via stopping off at a lot of different friends' places along the way. And uh, people just turning this into a... Uh, almost, uh, I guess you could say, a, a, a person's planet vacation where uh, we had a great time on the seminar at Seas. It was just an incredible event. I got it. I got to tell you, if I was 30 years ago, someone said to do this, I would have said, I don't know. But boy, I'll tell you what. If someone, you know, as we as we learn and get older, it was really a, you know, I guess you you open your mind and you go. And it was, I'll tell you what, it was incredible. Um, so uh, maybe people will talk about it in uh, in the room as we move on. But uh, I just wanted to continue on with uh, looking at the markets here last week. I know we were kind of concerned as uh, the market was maybe setting itself up for a potential bearish divergence. And again, we we did get a newer high in the market, as everyone can see. What does that really mean? Um, you know, we got a daily higher high. And uh, we did not see confirmation from a new high in the advanced decline. So we did actually um, pop up and get that little divergence on a daily basis. So the market's going to open a little higher here. And I think one of the, the another uh, analogies that we, we look for is the systematic uh, approach to the strength of, a, of a, a strong market. And typically what you've seen is, a market opens lower, trades higher, opens a little lower, trades higher, opens a little lower, trades higher. And so we get green candles on the way up. Uh, every once in a while, you just get the you know a lower opening over here, lower opening, trades higher. Market opened lower, traded higher. Market opened unchanged, blasted off. So I think what we want to be watching for is if if in an uptrend we get the higher opening, the lower openings and the higher close scenario. What we want to watch for is the reverse of that. And then as the market's detrending, watch for higher openings and lower closes. So that would be to see if right now uh, what we are, what we'd be waiting for is to see if this market is just going to conform to uh, a little bit of um, grind and stay within maybe this shorter term channel. Um, I would not... Um, look to see the market sell off dramatically uh, unless the Federal Reserve, the FOMC market committee says something uh, profound, which I don't think they will. Um, this is one of those really short meetings. It's a two-day meeting, but there is no press conference, so I don't think there's going to be any policy changes here. I mean, if there were, it would be quite a, a stir in the markets considering the fact Janet Yellen just sat in front of the Senate subcommittee and her semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins testimony, if, if we all recall that, we, we just had her go through and get drilled by both the Senate and Congress um, and the finance committees on what the Federal Reserve's uh, looking for and looking to do. So if she changes that, I think it would cause, it would, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see any change from that sentiment that the uh, she set forth, but you never know. So uh, with that said, we have an enormous amount of uh, data to, to look at in the queues, in the daily charts in the queues. Everyone can see the on balance volume. Last week's rally was on a diminished volume move. In other words, we had, again, higher price. And if we take a look at the trend here, price moved up and the indicator moved down. So that was on weak volume. Prices moved up, and in the NASDAQ 100, the advanced decline moved lower. So we did not move in concert. And this is like actually kind of an anomaly. Um, it's one of the first times this year that we've actually seen both the on-balance volume and the advanced decline kind of join in sync. We, we've had many times where the volume was up and the advanced decline was down, or we had the advanced decline up and the on-balance volume down. So we, we really have had some trickery here, but now we're starting to see 
uh, a clear-cut signs of divergence both in market participation rate as well as looking at the volume participation rate. So looking at the diamonds, even though we did not get that, um, we we did not get that um, newer high last week in the Dow. Um, we did get that kind of meltdown that that you know the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We didn't really see a huge decline, but boy, I'll tell you what, it was on some good volume, and maybe people are afraid over the weekend for any maybe Middle East issues that's going on, as well as Ukraine issues and uh, issues all over the place. Um, but when I look at the daily charts, again, the Russell's the weakest, uh, you know, comparative to the rest of the sectors on a daily basis. What, do, what does the longer term outlook look like? Well, um, before I go into longer term, let me also finish off with, we, we did generate daily sell signals, but we've been doing that uh, untrustworthy for multiple uh uh, weeks in a row where we get a daily sell signal, but this time we got daily sell signals in all top five indices. We did not get a daily sell signal in the Qs or the NASDAQ 100. What does that mean? It means we still need to be cautious that the market is certainly uh, having, uh, it's showing signs of duress. It's showing signs of being tired up at these highs. It's not certainly demonstrating that fortitude strength on, on a market rising on an increase in participation. When I turn to my longer term analysis, I note that the S&Ps came and still managed, they formed a doji last week uh, in the marketplace. We still managed to maintain closes above the weekly moving averages, so that's still bullish longer term. We still managed to close above the weekly moving averages on the weekly charts and the queues. We still managed to close, even though it looked uh, this it, it, it's kind of funny if you look at this chart. It, it literally is a Christmas tree on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? I mean, up green, down red, up green, down red, up green, down red, up green, down red. Every new high is followed by a subsequent, you know, correction. It's not that we're seeing up, 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 up and away. So the market is is showing that it's signs of tiredness near the 17,000 in the Dow but it hasn't generated a weekly sell signal, and we certainly um, haven't seen a close below a prior week's low in an awful long time. So the weekly, to me, is still intact, but remember, um, weekly sell signals start somewhere. A weekly turn in the market starts somewhere, and that somewhere begins on a, you know, one trade at a time on a daily basis. So we wanna be aware uh, you know, of what's happening in, in the shorter term, which we definitely did create that bearish divergence. Now, what I say is that when we get that, and it happens on a you know the Friday meltdown, is it trustworthy? Well, people want to sell positions ahead of a, a summer holiday just in case something happens. And if nothing happens, you know, there's no scare because we definitely have some uncertainties going on in the, the Middle East and Israel and Ukraine, and the list goes on and on. The fact remains, um, we are seeing a pause in many of the index. Look at the NASDAQ composite index. It didn't have any follow-through strength. We didn't break out and make new highs. Look at the NAS uh, New York Stock Exchange composite index. It, too, on a weekly basis, haven't broken out and made new highs. And the Russell, certainly, it's having a hard time managing to maintain yearly highs here. And then that that leaves the S&Ps and, and the Qs leading the charge. So what's behind the Qs strength? Why did it, it, it did form a new weekly closing high? What sectors are really um, running the game here? Um, Microsoft, if we take a look at some of the, uh, the higher defined technology names, we'll find that yeah, it, it's some of these larger cap, they just love their larger cap uh, technology names. And I'll bring those up in just two shakes of a lamb's tail, so to speak. Give me a second here. We're going to scroll down, and here's the technology. Here's what I wanted to share with you. So this is Microsoft, which has had a really uh, substantial move uh, over, over time. Last week, it formed a doji. Um, so when I look at my momentum indicator on a daily basis, you could see we are, you know, losing momentum. The market's made higher highs, 
and we're losing momentum. This green bar momentum indicator down here at the bottom is sharing the fact that as it's making newer highs, it's closing off those highs and it's forming negative uh, momentum, which means it's probably time for a, a, a pause. So when, let's take a look at a, a stock last week that a lot of people, I think, were probably surprised at the uh, reversal strength that, that contained uh, in the marketplace, and it was AMZM, Amazon. So, you know, Amazon, when we take a look at what happened with Amazon while we were on our seminar at sea, um, on the momentum indicator, the funny thing is, as many of you can note here, as prices were rising, and we formed a couple dojis, and it's right before earnings, note what happened to the momentum behind this move. It started to dissipate, and we started to move lower. When we take a look at Facebook, for example, and we say, all right, did you know Facebook had a very surprise move uh, for some to the upside, but boy, when we note that as it started to break out prior to earnings, Look at the momentum. It was making higher green bars along the way, and then all of a sudden, surprise, it popped to the upside. So there is some uh, consideration between scanning for stocks that are losing momentum and scanning for stocks that are gaining momentum ahead of earnings. This week, we have uh, a big name that's coming out. It's Twitter, TWTR. And, you know, there's there's been some... some, some both, uh, as you can see here, Twitter definitely has fallen from the sky, so to speak, from once being close to a $75 stock down to 30, and here we, we, we trade at 38. So how, how does the, the momentum fare going ahead of earnings? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's not a, a great read because there's not been a lot of uh, activity in this stock over recent days. I mean, it's been in a fairly, uh, you know, tight range compared to what it had been prior to the earnings back in May. But the momentum ratings are actually on a positive note, a mild positive note. So this, to me, doesn't say one. Um, it, it gives me a bullish bias to the upside, but not by a whole lot. So uh, if anything, we'll watch uh, Twitter as you take a look at your daily sheets. You'll note if we scroll down to the bottom, um, one of the, uh, this, as I get off uh, subject here real quick, um, this stock, the only reason it is um, in bold is its Norwegian cruise lines, and we were just on Royal Caribbean. So I just wanted to see after the close today how Norwegian cruise lines fares in all of uh, uh, the the uh, the cruise industry. So on Tuesday after the bell, we have Amgen, Buffalo Wild Wings, CHRW. That's a uh, you know transportation, uh, Fifth Serve. Uh, Newmont Mining, Panera Breads over here, uh, we have Twitter, we have Wynn Casinos, we have U.S. Steel, Vertex Pharmaceutical. I mean, we've got all the big uh, Affleck coming up, UPS is coming up before the bell, so Merck's coming out. I mean, there are some really big names coming out. Aetna's coming out, so between we have uh, some technology names and we have some uh, insurers coming out. Uh, Anico Eagle Mines coming out, so we have uh, some Newmont Mining, Gold Mining uh, stocks, um, Western Digitals coming out, WDC, Yelp, we've got Yelp coming out. So we've got a world of, of uh, opportunities here in the marketplace, and now it's up to us to see for stock option trading, you know, where do we, what, what do some of these stocks look like ahead of earnings? So uh, if we take a look at one of the other, uh, you know, WDC, Western Digital, just to look at this real quick, because it's had an amazing run-up, and I look at this, this, this move on a daily basis, and I say, wow, you know, that's a, that's a pretty amazing run-up. It had a low-closed doji the other day. That's the doji, that light blue, and that's a, as you can see, a, that purple color means it's an indicator that it says that that was a low-closed doji, and typically after one or two time periods, you see immediate results, and nothing happened. But as we've rallied into this before earnings season, we've done so on some, some pretty decent momentum, 
but now that momentum stalled. And so Western Digital, it, it comes out, it's not really a clear-cut signal because, look, one, two, three, four, five, six days has gone by. Six days have gone by here with no real uh, meaningful market action. What it has done, though, is it's negated a bearish sell signal and it's maintained higher closing prices. So that's why we've kind of lost momentum. But it doesn't give me a read that says, hey, let's get short this market ahead of earnings like Amazon was giving a classic sell signal or, hey, let's get long the market because it's, it's building positive momentum ahead of earnings. And it hasn't done that. So we'll need to watch these uh, names ahead of their earnings and at least see how the market comes out um, you know, from today's price action. Why do I say we want to watch the uh, main indices for today's price action? Because we sold off and generated sell signals on, on Friday. All these indices generated sell signals on Friday. In fact, the New York Stock Exchange generated a daily low close doji. But note that a doji here, a doji there, here a doji, there a doji, doji doji, dojis, you know, I don't trust markets that generate dojis all the time because, we're, you know, you want to be more trustworthy of the high and the low close doji when dojis are not present. When you get dojis all the time, how do you trust them? What I do look at is to see if the market's uh, going to have follow through based off that sell signal. So if today we form a lower high and a lower low or at least maintain some type of a bearish uh, scenario where the market may close less than the open, close, make higher, uh, lower highs and lower lows, some type of a bearish sign like that. That's what I want to see if there's follow through to the downside, not necessarily a crash to the downside because you know, the market's kind of relieved, not big news happened over the weekend, and the market still wants to sit in front of Janet Yellen. You know, when we go across the globe, we note that um, interest rates are changing, believe it or not. And I, many of you may already know this news, but Russia raised their interest rates a little bit to stave off uh, money flow exodus due to the Ukraine uh, crisis. And also, uh, New Zealand raised in their interest rates again as their gross domestic product has started to increase. So they are seeing developing economic growth. So uh, when you hear of New Zealand raising rates, so we're starting to see countries not just staying stagnant in a deflationary environment, but there are some countries actually benefiting from global growth and they are raising interest rates. So I know maybe longer term that's something we need to keep our eye on, but I found being on a seminar at SEAS a couple things that really tweaked my interest. One was of course looking at the knob spread. We've been talking about the knob spread and looking for a place to enter into the knob spread for a while and um, We've just been holding back because, quite frankly, it hasn't given us that lower high, lower low pattern that we're looking for that confirms that the bond yields are basing out and bond prices have peaked. And so I look at this market and I go, the stock market's near its highs, bonds are rallying, um, but let's take a look at this knob spread and see what we, we take away from it. Bonds are rallying. And I've just got this graph, as you can see. The last time the bonds got up to that peak price in the knob spread, and we're not that far away. We're trading at 1310 um, in the knob spread. So as you can see, this black line has gone up. That means the spread has widened, right? Now, that means bond prices are outperforming note prices. And clearly, you can see the two respective charts in the middle quadrant, we have the 10-year notes, and in the bottom quadrant, we have the 30-year bonds. Clearly, you can see there is a trend differential. Bonds are rising, and the notes are flatlining. So the interesting aspect here that I take away is people are more interested in having longer-term bonds in their portfolio. They're buying longer-term bonds. Now, why would someone buy a longer-term bond if interest rates go up? They tend to lose more money because the long end of the yield curve is more sensitive to interest rates. They're also, for that risk, getting a higher rate of return. Okay? So they're getting a higher rate of return. They're buying bonds. So that's where we say, okay, they're buying bonds. They're not buying notes as much, but notes are holding their value. Thus, the spread widens. In times that 
economic times that are good, in times that the stock market's rallying, typically the knob spread goes down. The knob spread's widening. Stocks are rising. Stocks are near all-time highs, but yet this bond knob spread is close to where prices were, believe it or not, in April of 2013. But look where bond prices are. We are significantly below that level, measurably below that level, that same point in time. So if we say, all right, when was the last time the bond knob spread was at this level? And you can say, well, it was at this point in time. And we move our little line over and we say, all right, well, John, let's be fair. Let's compare apples to apples. Where are bond prices? Uh, where were note prices when the last time the knob spread was at that level? And as you can see here, if I get it lined up correctly, it's actually right, you know, it's hard to even get the last time we were at that level, but it's closer to right here. So 1323 area, but I'm going to just leave it here as you can see. It's not that big a deal between this week and that week, but clearly you could see uh, from a, a line differential of where prices were in the respected underlying uh, products. There's a lot more room in pricing for notes to get up to that same point in time. And that, to me, is a worry. Because that tells me if the knob spreads over here, what happens if they decide to buy 10-year notes and they get up here? Uh, the knob spread will kind of stay up the same, and we have more room for bond prices to go up. So what's going to be the catalyst for bond prices to get back up to maybe 147? That's a heck of a rally. And the only thing I can come up with is maybe a market sell-off. Or perhaps that this is the last chance or the bond market may have gotten ahead of itself and they expect uh, something to occur with the Federal Open Market Committee's decision this week because it's the only other catalyst that's out there this week as well as the monthly unemployment. So this is a cause for concern that typically we do not see a widening of the bond spread uh, like this in a very short order as the stock market has been maintaining its highs and making, as in fact last week, as everyone knows, the, the S&P 500 futures made new highs. Now, they didn't stay there, but they made new highs. So I do have to say that we have some cause for concerns in the market, and the indicators and other tools that we're using suggest uh, uh, for the you know, every week we, we've come in here and said, listen, man, you know, there's, there is a cause for concern. And I think our market internals suggest that. The volume suggests that. More importantly, the seasonal suggests that. Lastly, the, what's happening in the interest rate markets that I don't know, since we were on a cruise, if it's even being discussed enough in the marketplace. There's an old favorite phrase that I've trusted for over 30 years, and it's that bond boys know best. The smart monies, the bankers trade bonds, and they know what's going on behind the scenes. So the bond boys are a little bit more uh, finesse. Uh, they're a little bit more savvy in understanding uh, global economic trends because they're, they're bankers. They're in that business. And so that's why I say the bond boys know best. Something must be going on because even on a weekly basis in the S&P 500, if you note here, the market had this big run-up, made new highs, and then we formed a doji. On what planet is that another bullish type of an indicator? Now, it could be the sense that tops take longer to form than bottoms. And sometimes, as I've written, the markets try to bore us out or scare us out. And so we could be seeing a delayed reaction here over the next few weeks, um, or maybe as we complete earnings season, or possibly as we get through not only this FOMC meeting, but perhaps as we get through the monthly unemployment report. Remember, the Federal Open Market Committee meets every six weeks. So after this time, the next time we see the Fed is going to be in September. So what typically happens in August time frame? Nothing. The world generally goes on vacation. Typically speaking, August is, on average, one of the least volatile months that we have in the market on average. There have been, of course, naturally, a few exceptions. Um, 
But we need to be on guard for that. But typically, the world does go on vacation. Ask a European, uh, ask an Italian, ask the French, ask the Germans. What do they do in August? It's family vacation time. So we have the world, the Brits, the et cetera, et cetera. Americans, we've got college kids going back. Moms want to see their daughters off, et cetera, et cetera. So there is more vacation time taken in August as it, we wind down the summer season. And the irony is summer doesn't really end until September. So with that said, I think the words of wisdom is to monitor some of these trades this week for maybe some options, uh, opportunities, and to see if we get a loss of momentum on stocks that are rising that have earnings ahead of them, or see if there's an increase in momentum, and that might give us a tell like it did with Facebook and like it did with Amazon. Uh, of what might be coming. And then we can price accordingly. But make no mistake, this is a, a very interesting week with a lot of heavy economic numbers, a big event with the FOMC announcement, and of course, last but not least, earnings galore. So there's something here for everyone. And if, again, I will be watching to see what and if we get any type of follow through in the market today. Um, after all, we didn't get a whole lot of downside action on a weekly basis except for a doji on the S&Ps. So when we look at an intraday basis uh, of the S&Ps for today, Monday, I suspect, A, we have a few things to pay attention to. The daily moving averages are just trading at approximately, as I bring this up to you, daily moving averages are right up here against that 75 handle, and that's just where we popped up in pre-hour session. Let's take a look at our uh, day trade page and see what we have for today in most of the markets. And so we're going to get here in just a second as the wheel is spinning. And just give me one quick second. And I've got one more major announcement to make after this. Just take a second here. We've got a lot of data on these pages and it just takes time to come in. So as you can see the S&Ps we popped up to about that 70 near that 75 uh, uh, number today and uh, on an intraday basis and we got up to 74 and a half and here we are trading back down to 72. So the market's going to kind of struggle up here. Let's see if we, actually let me just go up and I'll just make it quick with the trade station page and couple things that I want to focus in on today. Number one is we have resistance. I'd look at this. I don't know if we're going to be able to. If the market's truly bearish, and as you see, person's pivots already for the day has a blue pivot that's below the all over gold pivot point moving average. If the market's truly bearish, we should actually stay below today's um, 1977 and three quarters. So if we do have any follow through weakness, we don't want to see the market take out that high. We want to see the resistance hold up. So uh, between today's already pre-session high, if the market does take out and if we see acceleration in the open outcry in the next two minutes, and if we see acceleration and we take out this swing high of 74 and a half, the market's going to want to probably take a test run up to C77 and three quarters. So that might be a, a, a little breakout play to the upside. Let me show you something else. I've already teed this up for you. Now, without looking at pivots, if we just take a look at this simple little trend line analysis, you'll notice not the absolute low, but the average of lows. You'll note that when we come right into near that also, uh, as you can see here, right into that 77 and a half level, Guess what that, that represents? These lows in the S&P. So old lows may represent new highs. Or in other words, old support is new resistance. It's also the pivot resistance target. So if the market is going to uh, respect the daily sell signal from Friday, the market should not get above that 77 and a half level. There's the opening bell. I hope you enjoyed today's Monday morning uh, exercise or at least planning and scanning and what we're looking at as far as uh, follow through in the markets. And lastly, I want to say since in our absence last week, we had several students that 
uh, really stepped up the plate to help out the community. Andy Wyant, uh, number one, certainly uh, deserves a, a a a great hand. He's been just a he's just a trader. He's just an individual guy. He's been with us for a very long time. A uh, very special person, and uh, took the time to to really uh, help us. So with that said, I wanted to say thanks a lot uh, to Andy. And uh, I want to sell Bill McKee as well was right up there. Jeff Scott was another individual. So there was some there was some real neat uh, people that helped us to uh, make this inaugural launch of Seminar at the Seas a huge success. And we wish everyone was there. But we know that not everyone could be there. But I want to say, actually, uh, thank you to those three individuals. Again, really outstanding. And I hope everyone appreciates that. So outstanding job, Bill. And outstanding job, Andy, and thank you very much. Uh, it's guys like you, again, you know, um, it's always, uh, no one ever has the, uh, um, uh, the, the success all by themselves. There are people behind the scenes. And as you know, Mary is my wife, is the one that is really, truly uh, an amazing human being, and she really did outdid herself for that cruise. I see Richard Lauder uh, milks in the, in the house. Richard was there. I can't believe he made it home so fast. But uh, uh, anyway, Richard, we hope uh, it was wonderful to sit with uh, you and your wife and the gang at dinner. Uh, yes, that was a long dinner, but boy, it was uh, it was nice to to sit down and, and and really spend quality time with individuals. So I want to say thank you, everyone. Anyway. Thank you very much, guys. Great times, and let's see what the market brings for us today.